Welcome to the Free Will Show, a podcast that provides a beginner-friendly introduction to free will while also exploring cutting-edge developments on the topic. I'm Taylor Sear. And I'm Matt Flummer. This is our first episode on open theism, the view that we have free will and that it is incompatible with divine foreknowledge. Our guest is William Hasker. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to introduce William Hasker, who's Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at Huntington University. Uh, Bill has written on a variety of topics in the philosophy of religion and philosophy of mind. And over the years, he's defended a view called open theism, which we'll talk about today. Uh, On that topic, uh, Bill is well known for contributing to an influential book on open theism called The Openness of God, which was published in 1994 by InterVarsity Press, um, as well as his book, Providence, Evil, and the Openness of God, published by Rutledge in 2004, among other books and, and many papers. Um, We're very happy to have you on the show today, uh, Bill. Uh, Could you start by telling us and our audience a bit about yourself, your work, and how you came to be interested in working on issues related to free will? Right. I'll be glad to. Uh, I have a PhD from New College, Edinburgh. Um, And as uh, as you indicated, I've been interested in a variety of philosophical topics. I taught for many years at Huntington University in Huntington, Indiana. I've been retired for quite a few years, but I continue to be uh, pretty active in writing uh, and so on. Uh, As for free will, I think this has been a concern of mine uh, since since always. (laughs) Uh, I remember... You know, I I had a course on the thought of Augustine with Arthur Holmes at Wheaton College. And what I came out of that was I loved Augustine, but I could not stand his deterministic theology, his belief in absolute predestination and so on. I just, I, I could see very clearly what I thought, what that was about, and I absolutely rejected it. Uh, I had a course in theology with also with, with Arthur Holmes, and a number of years later, he said that I was probably the most anti-Calvinist Arminian vocally he had ever had in class. <laughs> <laughs> he was saying I had uh, I was not only anti-Calvinist, but I had a lot to say about it and. Since I wasn't at all of his other classes, I certainly can't quarrel with him about that. But that, that uh, the idea that we have genuine free will in the sense that it's really possible for us to do various different things, things different than the ones we actually choose to do, that, that's a conviction that I think has never been shaken. But another thing that I remember... While I was in college, I first heard of the theory of divine middle knowledge or, or Molinism. Yeah. And my immediate reaction was that this can't be right, because it seemed to me that where a person's free choices are concerned, there can't be an answer to what the person would choose unless the choice is actually made. I mean, that was just, that, I hadn't read what any philosopher said about it at that time. Mm-hmm. It's what's since come to be known as the grounding objection. But that just immediately seemed to me to be a, a problem with a view. And I'd never been seriously tempted to accept it, though I know it's, it's certainly one of the main views on offer. So I've had this uh, this belief in in free will uh, since way back, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's never never been shaken. Um, for a long time, I didn't have a problem about divine foreknowledge and free will. I, I accepted that, that the two were perfectly compatible. Um, I comforted myself with the thought that so many others accept that foreknowledge 
doesn't cause us to act in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And so I was, I, I was happy with that and still, uh, until I read a famous article by Nelson Pike, mm-hmm. uh, titled, I believe, Divine Omnipotence and Voluntary Action, where he laid out very carefully the argument for the incompatibility of for human freedom and comprehensive divine foreknowledge. It seemed to be convincing. It still seems to me convincing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> looked at many, many different answers to that argument. None of them, in my opinion, work. So, um, so that set me on the, on the road towards uh, open theism. Mm-hmm. Interesting, yeah. Well, so far this season, we've talked about a variety of views on divine foreknowledge and human freedom. And all of them try to show that, in some sense, free will is compatible with divine foreknowledge. But as you just mentioned... Uh, on your view, divine foreknowledge would rule out human free will. Um, could you say why you think these are incompatible? Right, right. Uh, here's, a, here's a very simple way of looking at it. Okay. Uh, to, suppose I have free will concerning some action I might perform tomorrow or might not. Okay, now if I have free will in the sense that I understand free will, it's called the libertarian view, Mm -hmm. it's in my power to do either of two different things. It's really possible that I will perform this action or refrain from performing. Both of these are really possible. So the status of that future event right now has to be, it seems, that it may or may not happen. It's, it's happening is, uh, at present, uncertain. Okay? But now, suppose God knows what I'm going to do. Well, God's knowledge, I think we will agree, is, is and must be certain. Mm-hmm. God does things with his fingers crossed, right? Mm-hmm. So if God knows that I'm going to perform that action, then it is certain that the action will be performed. But here you have a straight contradiction. If I am free, it's uncertain, it's indeterminate at this point that the action will be performed. If God knows definitely that I will perform it, then it's certain that it will be performed. That's simply a contradiction. And those can't both be true. Now, uh, uh, another way to go about it is, uh, uh, let's assume that God knows that I will perform the action. Then how can it be that I have the power to refrain from performing it? Well, there, there is God's, knowledge or God's belief, we can also say, about that action, which exists now in the present and in the past. We'll assume for, for now that God is, is temporal, which he is, but we'll assume that anyway. There is God's belief in the past about the action that it will perform tomorrow. Well, suppose I decide not to perform the action. That would mean that God was mistaken in his belief. That can't be the case. But then in order to perform the action, I would have to somehow remove from the past God's belief about the way I was going to act tomorrow. And that also seems absurd. It's not possible that I should do something now that will bring it about that God didn't believe the thing that he actually did believe about tomorrow. That would be changing the past. Yeah. And so that, that seems uh, out of the question. So, uh, it, it, uh, now, you know, there are many ways of setting up this argument, many ways of trying to evade it. I think we can talk about so if you want to, but I think all the ways of evading the argument uh, clearly fail. Mm-hmm. The reason there are so many of them, many evasions, 
is that people really don't, a lot of people really don't want to accept this conclusion. Right. <laughs> so they want crazy <laughs> to come up with some, uh, some way of getting around it, yeah. but I don't think any of it work. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you can tell uh, whether an argument is a good argument based on how many different responses there are and it seems like this argument gets lots of different kinds of responses. It's not obvious where it goes wrong. Exactly, exactly. I think I think that's absolutely true. Uh, just an illustration of of that point. Uh, I'm reading a, a book uh, about the fine tuning argument for the existence of God that mm -hmm. that the universe seems to be fine tuned for life, and that many many uh, Physical laws and, and constants seem to be on a very fine, um, uh, fine balance to make life as we know it possible, and there are dozens of different answers to that argument. And I think this makes the point you just you just made: if the argument is really really is strong. But people really don't like the results, then you can expect a lot of different answers. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the arguments, the answers are are, are succeeding. Mm -hmm. It may mean that none of them is really succeeding. Anyway, that's yeah, interesting. Uh, I think you're. Well, I mentioned uh, this book earlier, the uh, the openness of God from uh, 1994. You were a contributor to that, and that book was helpful in giving a kind of uh, theological and biblical, but also philosophical case for open theism, and also kind of spreading the word about the view, telling people what open theism was. Um, besides the component that we've already been talking about, that free will is incompatible with divine foreknowledge, and also the belief that at least most human beings have free will. Um, what would you want people to know about the view of open theism, maybe about the open theist view of God or God's relationship with the world or human relationships with God or, or whatever else? What would you want our listeners to know about open theism? Uh, you're right. There, there's a lot to say there. And I might say that I <clears throat> personally, I, I started into the subject by reading Pike's article and thinking about it and so on. And I, I wrote a book, uh, myself published in 1989, entitled God, Time, and Knowledge. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but, but starting from the point that free will is incompatible with comprehensive, ex pre precise foreknowledge, there is a lot more theologically that comes out of this, and I've learned a lot, a lot from uh, Clark Pinnock and John Sanders and Richard Rice, in particular, who are all theologians who were uh, co-authors of the Openness of God. Um, let me say one one thing that comes out very strongly is that open theism emphasizes an interactive relationship between human beings and God. Mm -hmm. uh, God is open to us. God interacts with us. Sometimes people speak of a divine human dialogue, an interchange between human beings and God. Of course, this is illustrated in the Bible and in places where God is uh, talking to people, sometimes arguing pe with people. Some of the discussions between God and Moses get pretty intense and so on. Well, mm -hmm. this is something that open theists take very seriously. Uh, God, God is really cares about us. He really interacts with us. He really responds to what human beings do and say. And I think this is very, very faithful, very representative of the biblical portrayal of God. And there, there's a tendency in 
some uh, well, quite a bit of theology to back off from that, to make God more distant, more remote, or uh, there's a nervousness about Godding, God, so to speak, getting his hands dirty, getting too involved with human beings. Well, of course, there is a danger of, as we say, anthropomorphism, making God too human-like. And frankly, <clears throat> I mean, there are some, there's some passages in the Bible that are certainly anthropomorphic to the extent that you, you wouldn't want to take them absolutely literally. Of course, when, when God stretches out his arm, probably even the biblical writers did not think that God had a, a piece of meat <laughs> that he stretched out, right? But, but uh, you know, some of, maybe some of the uh, emotional responses attributed to God are maybe a little more human-like than we would uh, for sure want to take literally. But the tendency of open theism is to take all of this pretty seriously, to take the biblical depiction of God as a good portrayal of what God is really like. Uh, and, and theologians have sometimes backed away from this. Uh, Calvin notably said that God lisps when he talks to us. He's talking baby talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, how did, how did Calvin find out how God talks when he's being serious, you know, did God say to Calvin, well, you know, you can disregard this stuff in the Bible. I mean, you know, I'm not like that. I don't. Okay. Calvin was a wonderful, a great theologian, but I, I don't, I don't think we have to credit him in, in that respect. So, so open theism tends to take very seriously this biblical portrayal of God as interacting with us. Uh, open theism sees God as exercising immense wisdom in his dealing with the world. Well, one, uh, uh, one thing I should say that, that goes by the way, if you're an open theism, is the idea that God has a complete, fully detailed plan for the world and for people that is carried out in exact detail, okay? That's something that many theologies insist on, but it can't be the case according to open theism because if God, if God doesn't know precisely what people are going to do in this or that situation, God's plan has to be flexible. He has to adapt to the changing situations. And you know, this is exactly, uh, this is something the Bible actually has a lot to say about. There is an expression that is translated often as God repents. Mm -hmm. yeah. This occurs in the Old Testament something like 35 different occasions. It's saying God changes his mind. Uh, God repented that he had made Saul king of Israel. Well, Saul had a lot of potential, but it didn't work out all that well. God, and, but there are many places like that. The Old Testament scholar Terence Fretheim has made a special study of this. Uh, another, another example that I like to cite, John Goldingay is an Old Testament professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, which, as you probably know, is a quite conservative, mm -hmm. orthodox place. Well, Goldingay, just purely on the basis of his own study of the Old Testament, arrived at 
this position that, that God does not have complete comprehensive knowledge of the future and so God is molding his plans, shaping his plans as things develop. Uh, it was Golding A's students who informed him that he was an open theist. Mm-hmm. He, he didn't know about it mm-hmm. uh, before that. So, so now this, do, this does not mean that God is not in control or that God's purposes won't be achieved. God uh, God will achieve his purposes, but the detailed plans are, are uh, flexible. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, uh, in the end, it depends on on God's ability to make things, some things happen, but regardless of what human beings do. God is not simply waiting around. And uh, may I say, this is a big contrast between open theism and process theology. And some people, uh, I think, who should and maybe do know better, uh, perjure themselves, really. Anyhow, they misspeak by saying that open theism is a brand of process theology. In process theology, God really is lacking in power. Uh, God, as they say, God persuades, but he can never coerce. God cannot make anything happen unless uh, people decide to let it happen. And so in that case, God's ability to realize his plan is very limited, is indeed limited. But open for open theism, uh, for open theism, God has all the same power that God has according to Calvinism. And God is perfectly capable of creating a world in which everything happens exactly and only as God decrees that it shall happen. But for some reason, we believe that God didn't want to create that kind of world. An example that I've sometimes used, uh, are you guys uh, fathers, either of you? Yes. Uh, It's okay. Well, consider this. If you had the choice, would you want your children to be such that they would always automatically do exactly what you've decided for them to do? Okay, now maybe on some days that would seem okay. When they're, when they're determined to, to uh, frustrate whatever it is you want. But I suspect that on balance, you would say, no, I want them to be their own people. I want them to, to have their own decisions to make. I'm going to do everything I can to shape their lives in the best possible direction, but I want them to be able to make decisions for themselves. I think I, I, I see you're shaking your head, <laughs> nodding your head, and I think I think that's the way a parent would, at least hopefully, almost all parents would respond. Yeah. And I think God wanted us to be able to make our own decisions, and in particular, our decision to to respond to God, to love God, to serve God, or in some cases, the opposite. So, so it, again, it's not that God doesn't have the power that would be needed to make a world that was completely, everything completely as he had decided, but he wanted us to have that ability. He wanted to make real people that could decide on their own. Mm-hmm. So that that's a very, very important uh, theme, I think. Can I ask a quick follow-up here? So you think um, God could even know what we're going to do in the future if he wanted to. It's just that in virtue of knowing what we do, we wouldn't count as doing it freely. And so God kind of refrains from knowing the future, even though he could know it. Is, is that what well, you mean? If, he, if God were to uh, 
that's that's a, a view that some people do take. Actually, that God uh, just refrains from from knowing the future. Uh, but if God, for God to know, there has to be something that would determine or make it the case that we will act in that way. Because again, God's knowledge by itself, uh, we wouldn't think is is itself controlling us. So there would have to be some some other factor mm-hmm. that uh, that would guarantee that we would act in that way, and then God would be would would, would know it. And of course, for strict Calvinists, that's uh, that's not a problem. Yeah. God has established his decrees, his plan for the world. Everything necessarily is going to happen as God has decreed it. Uh, so uh, that's it. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, then one might wonder, well, what's the point of this? Mm-hmm. You know, but, uh, I mean, uh, Calvinists don't like it if you talk about a puppet show or things like that. But but th- that thought does you know does come to one's mind. So so I think now with um, with the theory of middle knowledge is tricky in that respect. Okay, middle knowledge says that they they say that we are free. We're, we're able to do different things, but there is this special kind of knowledge that God has that in whatever situation we might possibly find ourselves, God knows what we would do. And yet we're, we're perfectly capable of doing something different, but we always knew what they're called the counterfactuals of freedom, what these truths that say we're going to do. Mm-hmm. Very mysterious. And, and, and <clears throat> of course, a big question uh, in all of this is where do these truths come from, these counterfactuals that say what we would do under various circumstances? Well, God can't decide them. If God decides about these counterfactuals, then God has, again, complete control over what's going to happen. And and, uh, believers in middle knowledge will will reject that, reject the idea that God has control over these counterfactuals. But then where do they come from? William Craig, who is, you know, is a, uh, a big proponent of middle knowledge, uh, has written, God has to play the hand he has dealt. Yeah. Okay, the hand God has dealt is all of these counterfactuals that tell, tell him concerning each actual and possible person what the person would do in any situation. And then, but the, and they, these... These counterfactuals, uh, they're, they're contingent propositions. They could come out differently. Well, who deals the hand to God? <laughs> you know? or, or I sometimes figure, figure the, think of it like it's a, a huge multidimensional cosmic roulette machine. And God gives it a big spin and the answer it comes with is all of these zillions of counterfactuals. Well, of course, that doesn't make good sense. But uh, anyhow, it's something to think about. Mm-hmm. But, but uh, again, if, if middle knowledge is true, then God can make this completely detailed plan for all of human history and there it goes. Mm-hmm. It, it just it, he, he creates the world, and it just runs according to the plan. So, uh, as a follow up to Taylor's previous question, uh, let's take a proposition about the future. Like Taylor's going to have lunch tomorrow, 
Uh, what's the logical status of that proposition? Would you say that it's uh, like logically undetermined? You know that that's uh, an interesting point, and it's something that that open theists have disagreed about. Mm-hmm. Uh, one uh, one answer that was popular for uh, for a long time would be that there is a truth about Taylor's having lunch tomorrow. But this is a soft fact Mm -hmm. about the future, which roughly means, okay, it's true, but it's it's not set in stone. It's not it's not uh, uh, fully determined. That's what I used to believe. That I think that was what people generally were thinking about back in the seventies and eighties. There was a big controversy about hard and soft facts and how you can tell the difference between them. But I, I, I've, come to, I've come to see that that doesn't really make sense, that um, there, can, there is not a fact that you will have lunch or that you won't have lunch tomorrow. Though I would imagine the probability of your having lunch is pretty high. Uh, you're not on a, you don't look like you need to be on a diet. And, uh, <laughs> something really drastic comes up, you will have, probably it's very likely that you'll have lunch, but that's a probability. Now, now the, the view that I am, I currently favor is that propositions like that, that make assertions about the contingent future are, are not determinately true or false, that they have probabilities. And of course, uh, that being the case, God will know much more about these probabilities than than we do. So God has a, a much better idea about what's going to happen th- than we are ever able to. Yeah. But but they have probabilities. Now, uh, there's a view that is somewhat uh, popular among open theists at present, which would say that all of these, all views, all, all assertions about the contingent future are false. Mm-hmm. That it is, it is now false that you will have lunch tomorrow, and it's also false that you will not have lunch right. tomorrow. Now, that's, that's a little bit tricky. Anyway, any, any answer to this is going to be a little bit tricky, logically. Yeah. Okay, so... So, uh, you know, you, you've got to loosen up a little bit there. Um, but but it's true. What is true is that you might have lunch tomorrow and that you might not have lunch tomorrow. And they have this, um, uh, they, they, they have this worked out in considerable t- detail and, and it's logically a defensible point of view. Uh, again, I favor the view that that there is, that uh, the, the future tense proposition is indeterminate as to truth or falsity, but it has a probability. Mm-hmm. But, so that's that's the, the view that I favor. Uh, this difference, by the way, this difference does not make a, a lot of difference theologically. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't change the implications of the view to any great extent. Yeah. But but it's is an interesting and important logical question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've already touched on this, but what would you say are the, the main reasons for being an open theist? Yeah, well, good question. Uh, of course, uh, an important reason, I think, for for most of us uh, for, is that it does seem that Complete, comprehensive, exact, precise divine foreknowledge is inconsistent with our having free will. Mm-hmm. And it seems for many reasons important to say that we have free will. And I can go more into that. So, so that, that's, that's important, but it, it's, not, it's not the whole story. Right. There is 
biblical support for it. I've, I've just uh, waved at that in passing, but it's I, I don't I, I don't think the Bible is completely clear and explicit on this, but I think it is biblically biblically a defensible uh, point of view. It is appealing, I think, because it stresses the interpersonal interaction between between human beings and God, uh, which tends to be, to to sort of be obscured the the more, uh, the, the more you stress God's distance, God's remoteness, God's Exalt, exaltedness in a way that separates him from us, uh, you're losing some of that, the intimacy, the, the closeness between human beings and God. And, and I think it's, it's a real advantage to be able to take seriously the way the Bible portrays God as opposed to saying, well, that's, you know, that's for the children, but... Uh, here, the, the serious way to think about God is God is timeless, impassable, immutable, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, those things, uh, they get old after a while. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think, um, I believe that, and this is something I really should be talking about at some length, open theism is by far in the best position to deal with the problem of evil, okay? Um, Because um, the problem of evil, as you well know, asks the question, how can all of the evil and suffering that exists in the world, how can this be reconciled with the belief that the world is created and governed by a wise and powerful and loving God. That's an important and difficult question. Uh, Many people think of this as a very strong reason to disbelieve in God, Mm -hmm. not not to believe that there is such such a being as God. Well... If, frankly, if you're a Calvinist, I think you have an impossible problem here. <laughs> because for, for the, the strict Calvinism, everything that happens has, is exactly the way God decided for it to happen. Everything has been planned out to the finest detail. And there was there were no constraints, no no limitations on God, except of course he can't he can't will things that are contradictory. That would be silly. But aside from that, there are no constraints or limitations on what uh, what, what God has decided. And you know when you think of some of the evils that there are in the world that is awful. That is horrible. And if, if if you believe that not everyone comes to faith in Christ, that people, some people are eternally damned. Well, God has decided that. That, of course, the Calvinists will say, well, they're damned for their own, because of their own sins. But God decreed that they would sin in just that way, in just the way that they did. And God decreed that they would never come to faith. I, I just have no hope for that, for, for a decent answer to the problem of evil. If you're a Molinist, a uh, believer in middle knowledge, it's some better because you are you are saying that humans have a free choice whether to sin, whether to believe in Christ, and so on and so forth. But still, God has worked out this 
complete plan from the beginning to the end. And everything that happens, every individual event is part of the, explicitly part of that plan. And God has said, okay, this is what's going to happen. This is what I'm going to have happen. Mm-hmm. So God, God is not, <clears throat> he is not, you might say, as responsible for all of the evil as he would be given Calvinism, but it's kind of a fine line. He certainly, he is, God has decided to have just this world with all the evils and suffering that it contains. And, and that's, that's a problem. And this becomes a problem uh, for people in, in their lives, too. I mean, uh, if something, something really bad or tragic has happened to you or someone that you know, then, then you ask yourself, well, why did God plan for this? Why did God have this happen? Why is, was this part of God's plan? And people can have a very unhappy time trying to figure out the answer to that question. And for many people, and I know my, my friend John Sanders has had many, many people write to him and, and talk about this, it's a tremendous relief to be able to say, no, God didn't want this to happen to me. God didn't plan for this terrible thing to happen in my life. God feels sorrow along with me. And that, that's another aspect that God is compassionate. God really, uh, he, he feels sorrow mm-hmm. when bad things happen to people, but God feels sorrow along with me, but God is working in my life to enable me to recover from this situation. And many people find this extremely liberating. Mm -hmm. I I have to say there there are things that uh, I know about that it, it would bother me greatly to think, well, God has planned for this particular thing to happen. Uh, that, that creates a big problem. I mean, and this is in real life. This is not just in the theology. This creates a big problem, and it's a big benefit to not have to think that way, <laughs> not have yeah. to think that God is deliberately planned uh, for this evil. So I, I, I think that uh, on balance, uh, and another another thing that's uh, part of that is, well, suppose you conclude, as people sometimes do conclude, well, God wanted me to do so and so, but I, for some reason, I took a different course, a different course. Well, what about it? Does that mean that God's perfect plan didn't happen? And, and what do I do now? Well, for open theism, that, that also has an answer. Okay, God, God may have wanted you to do something different in the past, but now you, are, you have repented of that. God will help you make the best choices now and in the future. So I think that it's a, in my in my view, it's it's a healthier way of viewing our relationship with God, uh, one one that has many benefits as compared with this idea of the absolute divine plan. The absolute divine plan sounds great as long as everything is going along well. <laughs> Things don't always go along yeah. so that well. I like that you mentioned the problem of evil and have been talking about um, responding to that as part of the motivation for open theism. A lot of the people that we've had on the podcast 
when we asked them how they got interested in thinking about free will, have said something about the problem of evil. So it's kind of unsurprising that um, they would come up in this context too. And I, I like the way you compared um, the different views of providence, um, kind of weighed them against each other. That was really helpful. Um, if we could, before we wrap up, ask you about a potential objection to open theism. I can see someone at least initially worrying that on the open theist proposal, um, you'd have to give up the doctrine of divine omniscience, right? That God's all knowing because, well, it seems like if we have free will, then God can't have um, exhaustive foreknowledge on the open theist view. In, in fact, God doesn't. So um, h- how would you respond to that at least initial worry about divine omniscience? Oh, good, very good question. And of course, we open theists do not want to give up on divine omniscience. Uh, the way the way we you approach this depends somewhat on a question that was raised a little earlier. What what is the status of the propositions about the future, like about your having lunch tomorrow? Uh, suppose we assume that that there are truths about the contingent future, um, then what we say is, okay, there are these truths, but these truths are impossible for anyone to know for, for the reasons we will have spelled out. And if we're going that way, this parallels a very common move that we make in talking about divine omnipotence. Right? Can God do everything? Is God all-powerful? Yes, God is all-powerful. Can God make a, a round square? No, God can't make a round square because the idea of a round square is a contradiction. It's 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 contradictory to suppose that anyone could make a round square. So, and God's ability to do anything does not include contradictions. Another favorite is, can make God, God make a stone so big that God is unable to lift it? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, there's an answer to that along the same lines. The idea of a stone God is unable to lift is contradictory. So, God can't do something contradictory. And in the same way, the idea of God or anyone knowing, in the sense of certainty, knowing truths about the contention future is, is contradictory. So, so there's that parallel. Now, it's even simpler if we say, as I now would say, that there aren't any such truths to be known. And so... God, in that case, we just simply say, God knows everything that is true, but concerning many aspects of the future, there isn't any truth to be known. So I, I don't think it's, it's, really, it's, it's really a big issue, but it's certainly one that occurs to people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what would you take to be the biggest objection or challenge for open theism, and how would you respond to it? You know, I, I'm not in, uh, I'm not overly impressed by any objections. Well, one objection, I mean, one objection that you know probably does need to be taken seriously is the, the objection based on tradition. That is, mm-hmm. in the history of the church, this has not been a widely represented or accepted viewpoint. Uh, you can find some, you know, some inklings of it going back, but only in the 19th and especially 20th and 21st century is it really becoming uh, a major issue. And I was like, okay, that's that's right, and uh, and I think the, the tradition of the church deserves to be taken seriously. But not absolutized. Um, there have been major points in the past where views widely accepted in tradition have been rejected. Uh, when you compare it 
with, say, the Protestant Reformation, the move to open theism is a pretty small issue. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so you know, if you're if you're Roman Catholic, this probably is going to have a lot more weight. But I think for a Protestant, I'd say keep your keep your respect for tradition, but don't absolutize it. Uh, of course, uh, in some church circles, open theism has uh, has a bad name and uh, will get you in trouble, and uh, hard, it's hard to survive in certain circles uh, with this viewpoint. Uh, that's a fact. Um, hopefully, it gradually, gradually can change. But but it's a fact. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I, the the view still exists. It still it certainly is more than holding its own among the coming generation of ph Christian philosophers, and, and so I think it has a future, but it has to overcome that that kind of resistance. Mm -hmm. So I guess those are those are things I would say about. Uh, issues for, yeah. for the view. Those are nice points. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Bill. This has been a really great conversation. Um, if our listeners are interested in reading some of your work and following what you're doing, um, where can they go online to follow your work? Well, there's there's one suggestion <clears throat> that I would make. There is a, a Polish philosophy journal uh, the the name of the journal in English is Annals of Philosophy, A-N-N-A-L-S, Philosophy. If you look, if you uh, put that into your web browser, you can get their website. And it's a, it's a print journal, but it's open access. And if you, if you click on the January 2000, 22 issue, that will be an issue of the journal that's devoted to some of my ideas. It's called the Sketches of a Bigger God. And it's uh, a number of philosophers have written, written um, articles discussing aspects of my thinking, and I've responded to them. So that's an, a place where you can get some uh, some interesting introduction to some of the things. That issue also includes a complete bibliography up to the time when it was printed. So that's, that's a good place to start. That's great. Very cool. Yeah. Thanks again for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. In our next episode, we'll continue to talk about open theism and our guest will be Patrick Todd, Chancellor's Fellow at the University of Edinburgh.